How, how would you describe sports psychology to somebody who's never heard of it before? Well, it, it's, it's about maximising on yourself. It's about dealing with your own doubts, fears and anxieties. About letting the positive you defeat the negative you. Because really psychology is a, is a battle of you versus you. We, we think the opposition's over there in the other dressing room, but actually it's in here. Let me tell you a story that started in 2009 at a tournament that only a select few people still on the scene will remember. It was called the New Order Tournament 3 in Ettenleur, the Netherlands. 40 plus entrants went in and only one went home happy. At TNOT3, there was an inconspicuous attendee by the name of Xonar. At just 16 years old, he did not know that this was the first step in a journey full of self-doubt, rejection, and most importantly, a journey full of growth. And just like that, Xonar made the one and a half hour trip from Arnhem to Ettenleur that would define the following decade and a half of his life. And I would know, because Xonar, that's me at just 16 years old. Competition is something that is ingrained from a young, young age. Yeah, that's a nice grade, but how does it score as compared to your siblings or classmates? And it makes sense. A good way to measure someone is to define something as desirable and then see how well everyone does at achieving it. And with that, the metaphorical dragon is defined. And you, the knight, you set out to slay the dragons. And Tonar slayed some dragons. As a 16 year old kid, he did not yet have a lot that made him him. And competition was his way to define himself through comparison to others. On his path, he learned a lot about the various dragons that he had to slay. Each dragon hiding his own treasure, a treasure that represents the dragon that he had to fell to get further into the bracket. Finding those treasures, finding those lessons and making them your own is the very act of improvement. There's a lot of treasures lurking in competition, not just those related to improvements. Yeah, some opponents will teach you not to roll out of the corner or constantly reversal or double jump back to the stage. But for what reasons do we covet treasures? For what reasons do we seek out this knowledge? It is at the end of the day to get rich, but there are so many different ways in which you can get rich. I know people who played Smash and got social status. I know people who got validation. I know people who got identity and so much more. In other words, winning is nice, but what does winning do for you? Or to rephrase it more poignantly, losing sucks, but what does losing mean to you? And I think a lot of people, they don't pause and reflect on why they play. And through that lack of reflection, they let these secondary goals overcome the primary goal, the reason you started playing. What does that mean to you? Smash, it always starts as fun. But once you get that taste, that taste of, for example, approval, what does that do to you? What does that start to mean to you? A lot of people, they don't want to be dragons. They'll say, I'm a problem solver, not a problem player. But competition requires you to reflect on who you are, why you are who you are, what you want to achieve, and what you're willing to sacrifice to achieve that. And in a lot of cases, these ideas are dissonant. Some people aren't where they want to be. They don't want to accept why they aren't where they want to be. They don't understand anything about what they want to achieve, and they don't even want to sacrifice enough to achieve that, including Sonar. All that being said, after a good couple of years, Sonar finally got what he wanted. He found an identity that extended beyond Smash. And with nothing left to gain in the world of Smash, soon left to attend college. The end of a chapter. Just five years later, a familiar face would pop up again in the Smash scene. And that's me, Ramses, ready to take on Smash 4 with a different perspective entirely. Over the years of playing competitive games, I realized something. Whenever I'd win or lose, it would always say more about me than the opponent. I had become the dragon I was trying to fight. 
Getting on neutral by Sheik, it's my inability to make a read when it counts. Getting cheesed by Pac-Man, it was them confronting me with my lack of knowledge. The other is an illusion of the self. This didn't change anything about the practical dynamic, it just helped me see a point that was always true. My opponent is a mirror, showing me a reflection of myself. All those times that I attributed negative aspects to my opponent was really just me refusing to identify with my own mistakes. It was a moment to reflect on what I've been taught, a clear divide between me and the outside world, rather than the entire fairy tale being me. I was the dragon. I was the village terrorized by the dragon. I was the hero gathering courage and wisdom to defeat the dragon. I was the mountain of riches guarded by the dragon. And at that moment, the divide between outside and inside fell apart. At the end of the day, everything that happens is my interpretation of what happens. And this feeling of total control was equal parts liberating as it was terrifying. I stopped competing with the world, but the world still wanted to compete with me. And accepting this was harder than I wanted to admit. And at times, it still is hard to accept. When you start contextualizing your actions entirely within your own inner world, you realize that others will never, never have the context necessary to see your actions for what they truly are. Yet people will try because they feel like they can. And that's your burden to bear. And as you evolve and you climb that mountain, fewer and fewer people will be able to relate to what you're doing. At first, at the base, most people can empathize with you. After all, the less unique experiences you have, the less unique there is about your journey. People will relate. However, as you get into the territory where fewer and fewer people reach your level, your experiences will get more unique. If you're a top 5 Smash 4 Corn player from the Netherlands, that's already two circumstances that few people will be able to relate to. And others giving you what you want at that point will always be empty, because they, by definition, cannot give you what you want. How can someone validate you if they don't know who you are, what you've done, how you think, your problems, your context? Smash 4 Rams is just like that loneliness. Even if he had friends that could approximate relating, there were elements of the experience that felt non-conveyable because they were not conveyable. So without an order to blame and with a self burdened with responsibility, how do you cope with that? What I told you before is only a half truth. In your climb on the mountain, there is only one other party that truly joins you, and that's the mountain itself. And in that terrifying state of total responsibility over the outcome, I often blame the mountain, in this case, Smash. The only companion I could blame without hurting my own ego. It's not just every action in the context of my own inner world, it's how that inner world interacts with the outer world. The self is contextualized in the system. But it's a fickle barrier. Once you understand and have made peace with the interaction between the self and the system, all that's left within your control is you. Once you understand how these interactions are set up, how the system responds to your inner world, you can factor it in. You're back in a driving seat. Smash then becomes a representation of your knowledge of self, of your growth as a human being. And in this fragile state of self, I see there's one final trick and I see it in nearly every coaching session. The ultimate trick that I see our brain pull on us is to not be ourselves. In an attempt to avoid damaging our ego, the brain will stop focusing on winning. Should we lose in this state, we still have an excuse. If it's not Ramses, but Ramses playing bad, then that's not me. When you ignore your emotions and instead focus entirely on problem solving, it's not Ramses, it's problem solving Ramses. And by detaching yourself from your own experience, you can detach yourself from the outcome as well. To be fully yourself, playing not for a specific outcome, but for the act of playing. To know that the outcome could hurt, but to be in the present, nonetheless. To understand the systems, its rules, the meta, the consequences so thoroughly that you can disregard them completely. 
Once you pierce the veil of the other, once you encompass the circumstances of the self, once you accept the system, that is when you can stop slaying the dragon. That is the cruelty of competition. I tend to ask athletes three questions when they come to see me, and I have, I've had a lot of distinguished athletes come to see me over the years. And my three questions are, what do you want? How badly do you want it? And how much are you willing to suffer? Hey, it's me. Thank you for watching the video. I wanted to do a little bit of discussion on the subject matter. So I don't know who this video is for. I just felt like I had to make it after focusing on competing for a while and not posting YouTube videos. It is an amalgamation of my personal experience as well as observations during coaching. I noticed that a lot of students suffer from this externalization of the personal experience. If only others give me this, or if only the game was like that, not knowing that, at the end of the day, reality is an experience. It is your senses and your brain processing information. And while you cannot change what you process, you can change how you process it. I think this understanding of external versus internal is the most important step to overcoming hardships in competition. The external is essentially a veil. There's of course an external reality, right? But that reality has no inherent value. The value we attach to the external is the veil. However, getting rid of that veil is quite a burden to bear. People often struggle with the loneliness of the self. In most walks of life, you're not often confronted with this loneliness. However, once confronted, it has the room to become a beautiful thing. That is, if you stop complaining about seating. Once we realize that our desire for that external validation is an internal issue, we can regain control. Once we realize that our desire to be the best is not a goal, but a symptom of an underlying desire, we can take steps to truly understand ourselves. So if you made it to the end of the video, please let me know in the comments what this video meant to you. Again, I don't have a clear target audience set. I just want to throw it out there and see what sticks. So if something resonated with you, please let me know. I would love to talk to you about your thoughts. That's it. And as for always, guys, stay smart.